Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to From the Constituency. I'm Brian Calfano. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of people who are watching in the Ozarks tend to think about a lot is religion. And it has a lot of people, not just adherence to different faiths, but just folks around the country scratching their heads, wondering about what's going on with certain persons of faith and politics, particularly President Donald Trump. Wiki it's interesting with Wiki white Wiki. evangelical Christians, many of whom live in the southwest Missouri Ozarks region. 20 years ago, President Bill Clinton was the public face of moral decay in the country, and now President Trump, with his various picadillos, well, he tends to get a pass or, or a mulligan. Got a guy who is hot right now. He has appeared on CNN, he's appeared in the Washington Post, he was on C-SPAN, and he's gonna talk to 538, that's the New York Times, Nate Silver's blog, after he gets done talking to us, so we are really thankful he could fit us in. It's Dr. Ryan Burge from Eastern Illinois University. And Ryan, you've been pulling apart a lot of national survey data regarding persons of faith. And you've got some interesting trends that you've identified. And again, for people who are watching, a lot of folks who belong to evangelical churches or have a particular sort of conservative view of religion and politics, I think they'd be kind of interested in you kind of telling them a bit about why their group is so ardently in support, it seems, of President Trump. Well, that's the thing about evangelicals is we were always taught, and I grew up in the 90s in the religious right um, in a Southern Baptist church as an evangelical myself, and we were told that evangelicals are a special kind of Republican, right? They're a values voter Republican. They care about gay marriage. They care about abortion. They care about things like morality and pornography and obscenity. And we were told that we vote on these moral issues when we go to the ballot box. And so that kind of mentality is carried over into 2018. And a lot of observers think that evangelicals are still a special type of Republican who only votes for Republicans because of things like abortion and gay marriage. In reality, if you look at the polling data and you look at numerous data sets, They'll tell you a story that's consistent, that the, the evangelicals today, especially white evangelicals, are not just values voters. They're Republican voters across the board. They're in favor of strong national defense. They're uh, in favor of strong border security. They're also in favor of restricting abortion rights. But they're Republicans on almost every single issue that we care about when it comes to political ideology. So evangelicals are not a special kind of Republican. They are the prototypical, stereotypical Republican at this point. And they don't disagree with Trump on some things. Most evangelicals agree with Trump on almost everything in his public policy. Now, do you think this is because, or I guess do the data show, this is because Trump won the nomination and evangelicals are team players? So would you have seen the same degree of support if, say, Ted Cruz mm -hmm. had won? And of course, Cruz is much more of a, a personally pious kind of politician than Trump. So maybe it would have been even a little easier uh, or is there something more specific about Trump that they just happen to like because he plays to some of their concerns? Well, I've actually looked at the, the evangelical primary voting data in 2016, and Trump won every attendance category among evangelicals except evangelicals who attended multiple times a week. So Trump was their first choice. Uh, Cruz was the second choice, and 90% of evangelicals who voted for Cruz in the primary then turned and voted for Trump in the general election. So there wasn't a lot of nose holding or, you know, we have to vote for the Republican. Trump was their choice. And I think it's because Trump, for whatever reason, taps into what evangelicals like. He was willing to push the envelope on things like immigration. And a lot of evangelicals won't talk about that publicly. But if you look in the data, especially older white evangelicals, they rate immigration as one of their top five concerns in 2016. So that it wasn't like, well, we voted for him for religious freedom and so that we could say Merry Christmas and so he would put conservatives on the court for abortion. They voted for Trump because they liked his immigration policy and his defense policy as well. So he's really the total package for a modern day evangelical. He checks all the boxes. Although, you know, his personal morality is an issue, I think it's been pretty clear at this point that evangelicals are willing to look past his personal indiscretions because they care more about winning in, in the policy arena, which they've done over the last two years. You know, there's a lot of talk and a lot of historical documents out there written about the Christian right when it came together, the, the so-called new Christian right in the late 1970s. And the folks like Jerry Falwell and Paul Ryrich, they kind of made a deal with the devil, if you want to call them that, the libertarian, low, government, uh, low taxes, uh, less government Republicans. 
And to the extent that that's true, are we sort of seeing that the, the evangelical sensibility has kind of been taken over by these larger party and partisan dynamics in the Republican Party? For sure. I mean, I think the, the economic piece of, of evangelicals voting for Republicans has always been curious to us in academia because most, even guys like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, never really spoke a lot about things like taxation and regulation back in the 70s and 80s. They beat the drum of social issues and abortion. And it, it seemed like in those days especially, the economic issues were kind of like the come-along issue. Well, we'll vote for them for low taxes even though we don't really care about it because we want to make sure that abortion is not legal in America. It seems like as evangelicals have gained more education and, and had higher incomes as a result, the end result is that they are have middle middle class incomes to upper middle class incomes, and so they care about taxes and regulation more now than they did 20 years ago. So it seems like both pieces of the religious right have sort of come together in the 21st century for evangelicals. Now they care about social issues, but they also care about taxes and regulation, like the Republican Party platform talks about. So, so it, I mean, is it unfair to lay down the marker and say? There's not a dime's worth of difference between a secular conservative and a religious conservative in the Republican Party these days? There's very little difference. The biggest difference I can see in the data is on things like gambling. I know like sports betting has become like a major policy issue across the country. The Supreme Court made it legal or allowed states to uh, make it legal in the last year. And there are some, there's been some pushback. For instance, in Iowa, uh, the legislature passed a bill that would allow sports gambling, but the governor might veto it because she has a strong evangelical Christian base. But I think that's really the only time that we we see any evangelicals um, really deviate from what we would call, or in marijuana is the other one too. Evangelicals are typically less supportive of legalizing recreational marijuana. Than uh, I guess unless President Trump comes out in favor of it, right? Oh, that's actually a good point. If he's had not spoken about marijuana, if he does, it might change their view on it too. But they're not that much different even on those sort of social, you know, moral issues. But that's really the only daylight. Immigration, defense, taxes, abortion, they are Republicans through and through. What is the deal with immigration? I mean, there's so much talked about in church about helping the stranger and all that kind of stuff, right? And these yeah. are folks who tend to have a high regard of the biblical text. So how is it that we end up with folks who are far to the right in terms of supporting these Trump policies on immigration, which, which kind of go beyond where the Republican Party was even 20, 25 years ago on immigration? What, what is behind all of this? Well, in the literature, they talk a lot about uh, racial resentment, especially white racial resentment. And that the fact is that everyone has become exceedingly aware of the fact that the, the share of the population that is white in America is on the decline, right? Future generations are going to look more and more racially diverse, and the white share is probably going to drop below 50% in the next 20 to 30 years. That's what the Census Bureau tells us. And so the argument is that a lot of white evangelicals feel like they're under attack both for their evangelical beliefs, because that's, I mean, being persecuted is part of the evangelical ethos. They talk about it a lot. But also they feel attacked as in white people are being disadvantaged in America and that the rules and the laws of our country now give extra and special privileges to people of color. And they feel personally aggrieved by that. And a lot of people have said that what we see with Trump is sort of the last gasp of white evangelicalism, while it's still a, 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 a defining force in American politics. And in 20 years from now, there won't be enough white evangelicals to care. And what, what we see in the data is, if you look at older generations of, of, of white evangelicals, immigration becomes more and more and more of an issue. And that's probably because they see what's coming, right? And they see that society's changing, and that's scary to them. Uh, they want America to stay, you know, uh, we want English as the national language, right? We want to make sure there's a strong uh, background in things like the Ten Commandments in, in the Supreme Court building or saying prayer in public school. But why can't you have that if you have persons of color coming to the country? Um, there's a lot of uh, pushback on things like affirmative action, right? They feel like that the people of color get an extra advantage when it comes to admissions to college or job prospects or all these things. And they, and they typically point out how Democrats consistently talk about minorities and don't talk about the fact that white people are still the, the vast majority of the American population, right? And so. Republicanism has become fused with white racial identity in a lot of ways. I mean, you can look at it in the data. Uh, white evangelicals, 80% of them voted for Trump in 2016. If you look at all evangelicals, the number drops to 66%. If you look at black Protestants, 90% of those people voted for Hillary Clinton, even though they believe in biblical literalism and are opposed to abortion and gay rights. 
So there's been a fusion between white racial identity and evangelicalism, right? That those two things now are fused together in such a way that it's created this kind of potent political identity that stands alone in the American political landscape right now. So is it really not about religion at all? <laughs> no, honestly, I, mean, I, I know I'm going to talk myself out of a job right now because I study religion and politics, but the reality is I think it's a lot like when I say when people say the term white evangelical, the most important term there is white. It's not evangelical, right? Because we know that the racial descriptor is doing a lot more of the work than the religion descriptor. And what I'm arguing more and more as I look at the data is that it used to be that our first lens, our first paradigm, which we looked at the world through, was through a religious lens. We looked at, at politics through the view of our theology and our, our reading of the Bible. And I would argue in the last 20 or 30 years, something really dangerous has happened. And that is that we've we switched the political lens with the religious lens. So now we read the Bible in a political way. We see everything in this world through a political lens first, and partisanship has become our religion, and our religion has become secondary to that. So if we're a conservative, we go to a conservative evangelical church. If we're a liberal, we might go to a more mainline church, because we pick churches now based on our political ideology, not on our religious theology, and that's a very significant change in the last 30 or 40 years. Yeah, no kidding. Now, what about the young folks? Because there's at least a lot of anecdotal discussion regarding, well, you know, the, young, the youngsters are different. They're more open-minded about things, and they're more to the left than some of the older folks in that group. Is that true, according to your analysis? No. If, if you look at any data and you break evangelicals up into different age groups, we can see that the youngest white evangelicals are just as conservative as the oldest white evangelicals. Actually, the least conservative is the, the people in the ages between 40 and 60. They sort of stand, they're, they're, they're still Republican, but they're just a little bit further to the left than the young evangelicals and the older evangelicals. To think that there's some sort of coming wave of moderate or even liberal white evangelicals finds absolutely no evidence in the data. And what's even scarier is, if you look at the differences between young white evangelicals and young white young people in general, the, the gaps between their two positions on partisanship are as large as any age group in America today. So they're more polarized from the rest of American society, young white evangelicals are, than any other age group, which means there's going to be less opportunity for dialogue, less opportunity for discussion, real, you know, real positive potential change in political uh, affiliation is likely not going to happen because we are segregating ourselves off into these enclaves and not having real dialogue and discussion with each other about issues that we can agree on. Let me ask you just to sort of outline really quickly for folks kind of where all these data come from that you're referencing. So they have a sense of, you're not just pulling this out of some cold, dark place, sure. right? So the, the kind of the gold standard is the general social survey, which has been asked biannually or even annually sometimes from 1972 to 2018. It's terrific because it asked the religion questions in the exact same way it did in 1972. So it's a very, very good instrument to track the change in religious uh, behavior and belonging over time, right? They ask the literalism question the same way. They ask the church attendance question the same way. So if you're looking at long-term trends, it's the best. Now, there's another data set that's come on the, on the scene in the last 10 years called the Cooperative Congressional Election Study. It began in 2006, and they do it biannually uh, every year. They just released the last one uh, about a month ago. What's nice about it is it contains 60, over 60,000 respondents in each wave which means you can slice the data in these small little pieces. So I can look specifically at 18 to 35-year-old white evangelicals and get a couple of thousand of them in a sample, which means that my, my statistical certainty is very good, and I can make some pretty significant claims about how those groups differ from each other. And then there's other data sources. You know, there's little data sets that come out every once in a while that have maybe 2018 data, or there's panel data that I look at about how people change their religiosity over time. There's one called the the CCES, the Cooperative Congressional Election Study, has a panel where they ask the same people the same questions in 2010, 2012, and 2014. So you can look at how people change their religious affiliation over time, how they change their political affiliation over time. And what we find, interestingly enough, is in that panel data, me people are much more likely to change their church attendance than they are to change their political affiliation. Yeah, that's what boggles my mind, because when you and I were coming up, it was always the church drives the politics. Oh, for sure. And no. now, like you said, it's the complete opposite. Ryan Bird, you are at the bleeding edge of the cutting edge on this work. And again, there's no mystery as to why a lot of national media outlets are asking for your input on all of this, because you're helping us understand, and we really appreciate your time on all of this. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it.